Hi, welcome to Inside GraphTiliwiki, part one of three, Architecture and Philosophy. I'm Soren Bjornstad, author of GraphTiliwiki, which uh, we can see here out on the internet at graphtiliwiki.com. And this is a textbook to help you build a deep, lasting understanding of Tiddlywiki. Now, this is a kind of unusual textbook in that it offers some new features. It's written in Tiddlywiki. I don't know of anyone else who's written a textbook in Tiddlywiki before, and I don't think most other people have. So because it is different, and I've gotten a lot of questions about um, why did you choose to do it this way? Can I use this framework? Uh, can I use some of the ideas in this textbook? Uh, I thought I would do a series of videos just kind of describing why I chose to design it this way and how it works. So that is inside Graph Tiddlywiki. As the title suggested, this is part one of three um, in which I'm going to talk about uh, architecture, kind of overarching principles and a philosophy of um, what each of the components and decisions in Graph Tiddlywiki is intended to do. After that, I will get into looking at the most important parts of Graph Tiddlywiki that are custom. So for instance, the exercises, the live examples, the takeaways. And then in a third video, we'll talk about uh, a variety of other um, different affordances and minor changes that I've made to basic Tiddlywiki, such as uh, additional plugins. I've included the, the bookmarks um, mechanism here where you can uh, bookmark a Tiddler and have it show up, uh, the mechanism for sending feedback and uh, all that kind of good stuff. But in part one, architecture and philosophy. So we want to start this out with um, considering what I like to call uh, an explicit theory of how people learn things. So um, let's put that out here. Uh, this is step one. Um, and this maybe sounds kind of highfalutin um, and maybe a little bit off topic, um, since this is supposed to be about Grok Tiddlywiki and uh, Tiddlywiki in general. But I think it's actually very important. Um, sorry, can't uh, write and talk at the same time here. On how people learn things. Um, because it's actually very common to begin writing a book or some kind of educational resource without really thinking about how people learn things. And um, as a result, it's easy to produce learning materials that don't work because they don't actually match how people learn things. So you can end up spending a lot of time doing something very well that turns out to be completely useless because it's not what people actually needed or wanted. So to avoid that, it's good to understand how people learn things and then figure out how you're going to apply that. So I want to kind of show four different examples of uh, media and how they uh, assume people learn things, ending with Graf Tiddlywiki. So we're going to start with a, a traditional book um, or uh, perhaps a blog post or uh, any, any kind of just uh, standard issue textual medium. And so in the traditional book or blog post, we can kind of think the philosophy of how people learn things that is embodied by that medium is people learn things by reading words, right? So um, we're going to say that reading words produces understanding. Now, you're probably aware this isn't really how it works, or at least just reading the words doesn't produce understanding, right? If you're going to really get something out of it and remember it for the long term, you're going to have to actually do something with that. Well, that might be you. Um, whoa. I don't know what happened there. Hang on. Back to where I am here. Um, that might be you take notes on it. It might be you just think very hard about how each of the components of the book or blog post and what you're learning in it relates to your own work. It might be you go uh, do something with the information in it. But all these things are not actually part of the medium of the book or blog post. So. In a way, if your reader actually does get something out of it, it's because of them and not because of you. And I, I think most of us as authors, I know um, this definitely applies to me, would like uh, the reader not to have to do something that we didn't tell them to do, uh, that might not be obvious to do, in order to actually get something out of our work. So the traditional book uh, starts out in a good place. Um, it explains things, at least if it's a, a well-written book or blog post. 
it starts you on that path to understanding, but it's really actually missing a, a lot of the process of how people learn. And Andy Matischek has actually written a, a very good essay on this called Why Books Don't Work. Um, I will link it in the description of this video. It's worth looking at, uh, especially if you write things or uh, work in education at all, uh, just to understand kind of what some of the limitations are of books and lectures and um, how they can be paired up with other things in, in order to significantly improve them. The next step is um, what I'm going to call uh, unenlightened exercises. So as an example of this, um, I recently took a um, course on Microsoft Learn uh, for a certification exam in their uh, Azure cloud platform. And it, it was a great example of unenlightened exercises, uh, yes, plural. So um, this starts out with, um, so, we have the, the reading words thing, right? Um, so reading words um, produces, um, I don't know, we, we might want to get a little more precise with this, um, produces um, a broad overview um, or uh, conceptual knowledge. And then it's paired with exercises, but um, exercises could go in scare quotes here because they're not really uh, getting the purpose of exercises the way they did that in this course or in many other courses. I'm not picking solely on Microsoft. I, I wish their course had been better, but uh, it's not something that, uh, it's not a pathology that's unique to Microsoft, put it that way. Um, and so then what we're going to say is um, reading and following steps. Um, or instructions uh, equals practice. And then, you know, the this, this second part here, practice um, produces understanding. Now, why is this a flawed model? It's a flawed model because just sitting there and following the instructions that somebody else gives you um, maybe reinforces those instructions but it's not actually teaching you anything. If it is teaching you anything, it's teaching you to mindlessly repeat those instructions. And that actually doesn't tie in to what you just did in the previous method. So when we're using a, a medium that consists of multiple methods of producing understanding, probably we hope that they're gonna go together in some way, right? So in the first method, we're gonna read words to get that broad overview. And then in the second method, we're going to you know, apply what we learned in that broad overview and, uh, and reinforce that knowledge. But instead what happens is that we, we read something and we, we kind of get that broad overview and then we just sit there and we read and follow a set of instructions and so we learn how to do those particular instructions. Those instructions might relate to what's here, but it's really a completely separate form of, of rote repetition. And that's not actually practice. So this equals practice, this is false. Um, reading and following instructions is not practice. Um, I mean, it is practice following those instructions, but uh, it is not practice of you know uh, what we actually learned in the the broad overview and our a set of conceptual knowledge, because it doesn't teach us. It doesn't help us reinforce what we learned. Um, we are just following that exact set of steps, and if we end up in a situation where that exact set of steps doesn't work anymore, it's not going to help us. In order to actually. Uh, integrate that information and connect them, uh, we need a better approach to exercises. And we'll see what that looks like here. So let's say a good textbook. Um, a great example of this, uh, to go with my previous bad example, is uh, the Kerninghead and Ritchie uh, the book, The C Programming Language. Um, it's still a classic, even though it's about 50 years old at this point, which is kind of ridiculous in the tech field. Uh, C has gone through a couple more uh, standards revisions since then, but the, the root of the book is still good because of its approach to exercises. So in, in the good textbook, right, um, we're going to start out with this reading words produces a broad overview and conceptual knowledge. But then what we're going to do for, you know what, I actually am going to number these. I think it's going to make it easier to talk about them. So um, let's have one. Let's work perfect. Um, and then we'll have a uh, two. So here we're still going to have that one. 
but our number two is going to be um, solving novel problems. Um, produce transferable understanding. And so the difference here is that instead of just following a set of instructions, um, what we actually do is somebody gives us a specific problem to solve without telling us how to do it. We have to go figure out how to do it ourselves, right? That, that is the novel problems component of it. And so in, in a good textbook, instead of giving you a checklist of things to go and point and click on, it's going to say, uh, you know, write a program that counts the number of words in a text file, right? It's not going to tell you, go first write a function that does this, then use that function to do something else, then blah, 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 blah. You have to figure all of that out yourself. Now, this broad overview or conceptual knowledge will contain all the information you need to, to do step two if it is a good book. But you're going to have to figure out how that works yourself. And the way that this uh, improves your learning is because you actually have to figure out how to integrate that knowledge. You're, you're putting it into a new form because you're having to reorder the information that was presented in there, in there connect it to things you already know. And so that kind of process of uh, repetition and uh, maybe like accretion of, of different layers of understanding is what's going to actually help you remember things. And it's going to give you that ability to solve other new problems, right? When you're just reading and following instructions, you learn how to follow those instructions. When you're solving new problems, you're also learning stuff that's um, transferable to other stuff. And I see that I, um, why is my eraser still on here? Um, come on. I see that I just left off a couple letters there. Understanding. All right. There is, however, still a problem with the uh, good textbook model, and that is that this produces a transferable understanding, but it doesn't help you retain that transferable understanding. So Grok Tiddlywiki is what we might call a next generation textbook um, in that it goes beyond the traditional uh, components of textbooks and the ones that are generally used today. And so in a next generation textbook, we're going to start with elements one and two as before. Okay, Ooh, that was terrible. Um, it's very hard to draw straight on a tablet. Um, but then we're also going to have a step three, right? Which is um, guided repetition. Um, what should we say? Um, guided repetition um, preserves understanding. So once we've learned something, uh, whether that is through mode one of explanations, um, or mode two through transferable understanding, we're going to keep doing it over and over again. And we're going to get little nuggets of information that remind us to review what we've learned. And this is helpful for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that um, I did the exact same thing again, didn't I? Preserves understand. Preserves understanding. Um, the, f the first is that it's going to help you learn new stuff because you're not continually forgetting uh, the previous iteration of, of information. If you've forgotten the, you know, the basic vocabulary that you're using to, to work with a problem, um, it's going to be hard to kind of go up uh, to the next level. Whereas if you're being reminded of that regularly, it's going to be much easier to, to build the next layer of difficulty on top of it. And second, if you stop learning for a while or you finish learning the topic, but then you don't use it for a while, uh, you're going, as long as you keep on um, with your guided repetition, uh, you're going to be able to continue to remember it even after that time. So Grok Tiddlywiki as an next generation textbook, as you've probably figured out, um, it's the only full length textbook that I know of currently that includes this guided repetition phase. There are definitely other textbooks that do come along with flashcards or information like that. Uh, Grok Tiddlywiki adds spaced repetition to that. And there are also textbooks for which uh, third parties have made flashcards, some of which use spaced repetition, or even entire reviewing tools, which are often very good as far as they go. Um, what Grok Tiddlywiki does differently is by integrating that, making them by the same author, and making it all part of one tool, so that as you're reading along right within the book, um, you're going to finish reading a section and you'll come down and here are your flashcards right here. And then you also review right within the system uh, when, the, when the time comes. 
So that is our theory of how people learn things. There's a second part that I think can go with this, um, which I'm not going to give its own heading because I think it's very related. But I think it might be worth stopping to think about um, what kinds of knowledge is Graf Tiddlywiki going to teach us. And the reason I want to think about this is because it's going to make it much clearer where each of these three modes fit in. So the three sections that I'm, I'm going to put here are going to be rote knowledge, um, intuitive understanding, and pattern matching. Now, we could debate these uh, categories. They're not perfect by any means. I just think they're a, a useful way to think about the problem. You could probably come up with other ways to divide this. So just to be clear on what each of these things are, right? rote knowledge is things like um, you know, vocabulary. What's a tiddler? What's a link? Um, and basic uh, concepts. So these would be things like, you know, how, how do we use tags in TiddlyWiki? Um, what is the purpose of a widget? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, so we might have syntax. So there's, you know, in TiddlyWiki, there's wiki text and HTML and filters and, and all that kind of, kind the, all those kinds of things. These are kind of the, the basics. Um, you got to learn these things in order to understand, uh, move on to the next levels. Certainly, um, rote knowledge can sometimes be partially replaced by looking things up in reference works. It kind of comes down to how foundational there are. You know, if you don't know what a tiddler is, um, you're not just going to be able to look that up um, because it's information that you need to know in order to understand TiddlyWiki. It's the, the most basic concept of TiddlyWiki. But if you don't remember an obscure filter operator, uh, it's fine. You can kind of go retrieve that on demand. Nevertheless, the more of that you've internalized, the more of an expert you're going to be. Intuitive understanding gets a little bit trickier to define. Um, it's also a lot more difficult to figure out how to reinforce it in people. So this would be questions like, um, why solution one over solution two? Um, you know, why, why would I choose to use a macro instead of a transclusion in TiddlyWiki? Um, you, you might have kind of um, fluency of, of tool use. So TiddlyWiki includes a lot of um, what I might call new primitives. So if you're used to writing in a traditional system, you might have a, a long document. It might contain sections or, or chapters or something like that. Um, and you might move things between chapters, you might reorder sentences, you might add headings, that kind of thing. TiddlyWiki, you can certainly do all of that, but then it also adds all kinds of new things, like you can transclude things into multiple places, you can link between things, you can add tabs and expandable boxes, um, uh, you can include uh, dynamic lists of other tiddlers, all this kind of stuff. So you have to learn what those tools are good for, how to use them. Um, you also have to learn how to uh, actually activate all of those features in the user interface. You know, when you're first starting, you might have to pause and think, which of these do I want to use, and then go find the button, and then stop to look up the syntax. Um, and so obviously, I'm talking about stopping and looking up syntax, right? This is incorporating rote knowledge, too. Uh, it's, it's a necessary part of this intuitive understanding. But it kind of comes down to a new level. Um, some of this can be taught by um, giving information to people or by giving them rules. Um, so you might say, you know, as you're beginning, always use a link in this situation and a transclusion in this situation. But in order to really become an expert at it, uh, you need to figure out when those rules apply, when those rules don't apply. Maybe you even come up with your own set of rules, which are different from your teachers. And in fact, that is how uh, a community or a field advances is by people coming up with, you know, I, I think um, my teacher was right in this one thing, but I'm not quite so sure about this other thing. And then uh, you might have completely new insights there. Lastly, there's pattern matching. So this is um, basically past experience. Um, so pattern matching is what enables you to um, see what problems are. Um, so you might at the beginning be like, I have no idea what's wrong with this. At the end, you're like, oh, there's a missing period in my wiki text. Or it might be more complicated. It might be like, you know, this document is kind of hard to navigate and you figure out that it's because, you know, you haven't used an appropriate set of tags or you're missing tiddlers that, that connect other ideas or um, all, all that kind of stuff. And so this is 
kind of what you get just from doing something over and over again. Or um, by simply sometimes even having seen a very particular situation once is enough to produce pattern matching in a, in a new situation and improve, um, give you the ability to, to move on from there. So each of these kind of lines up with a different set of modes that are useful. So for rote knowledge, um, text is going to be very important. So it's just going to explain what the information is you need to learn and takeaways um, that is mode three, um, are, are also going to be very important. Let's just, uh, write these up here. Um, right. So one is going to be text, two is going to be, uh, exercises and three is going to be takeaways. And I talk about these three as, uh, the Trinity of Grok Tiddlywiki, um, in the, how to use this book section. Um, so this is lining up exactly with that as well. And, and I have a, a detailed e explanation of each of those three things. Um, Intuitive understanding, we're going to be looking mostly at exercises. That's the primary driver of intuitive understanding is actually doing things. Um, and the text is, is a secondary one, right? It's going to provide those rules that we talked about for um, beginning to develop your, your fluency and your understanding of why you choose something. But uh, you're not going to get that just from reading the text. You're actually going to have to try it and experiment. And for pattern matching, we are going to be looking at exercises, again, um, in terms of um, exercises, if the book is well written, I hope mine is at least reasonably well written. The exercises are going to give you real world problems that you see in the future and enable you to start creating that pattern matching. Takeaways can also help with this, especially for those um, small and very specific situations. Spaced repetition is particularly useful here because uh, it's easy to forget about patterns, um, uh, patterns of issues that occur only rarely. And when you have that spaced repetition algorithm, um, it's going to actually um, bring that up and preserve, in this case, preserve not exactly your, your understanding, but your, um, your readiness to see the pattern. If you, it's been a year since you've seen a particular problem and you've never used that information, you might not recognize it when it comes up again. But if your spaced repetition tool brought it up to you a couple weeks ago, uh, you're much more likely to, to remember that when it comes up. So, um, we're using a feature of, of spaced repetition, or as I labeled it up, your guided repetition, that involves just keeping things at the front of your mind by showing them to you at uh, particular intervals so that you're more likely to have seen them recently, or at least recently enough that because you're becoming more familiar with it, uh, you'll have that uh, basic um, ability to recognize the pattern. Now, these aren't exclusively uh, confined to these uh, two elements, right? Um, you know, intuitive understanding certainly can be developed by takeaways. It's harder than, than for the other two types, but uh, I do have some questions aimed at, at producing or maintaining intuitive understanding in there. It's also much easier for an individual user to create uh, cards for intuitive understanding. I think it's particularly difficult for the author of a text to do it. And that's just because the intuitive understanding um, depends quite a bit on what other things you know about and what connections you can make in your mind. And I'm not going to know what other things all of my readers know about, so I can't really uh, produce many of the most valuable connections in terms of intuitive understanding. Now, in Grok Tiddlywiki, we do have this option called Add Your Own Takeaway. So if you are working in Grok Tiddlywiki and learning something and you come up with those, you can certainly ask a question. You know, you can say, uh, Tiddlers are very much like um, foobars in the X software, right? So this might be something that, uh, a, an analogy that I've been able to draw. And so I can add that. And um, then when I come down here, oops, it looks like I found a bug. I accidentally created an, an empty item. Um, go away. I can't make it go away there. But as you can see, we've added a takeaway here, which will now um, you know allow me to, to schedule it just like any other takeaway. But as the author, aside from providing the ability to add new takeaways, that's not really something that I can do. And I don't want to assume that people will do it. So it's particularly important to, to include these other methods here. You can also see that each of these picks a, a different permutation of two out of the three. So they kind of all overlap uh, in a nice way. So that is Grok Tiddlywiki's theory of how people learn things. It's probably not perfect. Uh, there's probably some missing components. 
you know, maybe there's a number four here that would be um, in the in the next next generation textbooks, right, that could be added in to, to help people learn better. But I do think that this is a big step forward um, from certainly from most resources, which are, you know, all over here, and even a significant step up from the good textbook, particularly for topics that you might not use as much. You know, if you're reading the C programming language back in the day, um, you were going to probably embarking on a journey of writing a bunch of system software for Unix, which you would be doing every day for months, probably. There were fewer tools to learn back then, and C was a very foundational one. So when you are using something more regularly, spaced repetition is less important to take advantage of. It's still useful, but it is not nearly as important. But, uh, you know, with, with things like TiddlyWiki or, you know, with the Microsoft course that I took on, on the Azure Cloud Platform, you know, I, I don't really go in there all that often. I don't create new solutions very often, which is kind of a part of what that was about. And so it's much more important that we maintain that even when we're not actively using it. So I'm excited to see where these kinds of next generation tools um, that, that involve spaced repetition and perhaps other things go. Um, there are other people working on this. Um, one of the most important things in the mnemonic medium uh, kind of um, realm, which is just a, a term that combines at least the you know the text and the and the guided repetition, um, is Orbit. Uh, you can go to withorbit.com. Uh, it's a project by Andy Maniszczak, and it's um, kind of embeddable in any website. So you don't have to use a particular tool to develop it. You can just uh, have your blog post or your essay or, or whatever you want, and you embed these flashcards directly in it. So it's pretty nifty. It's not as well integrated as TiddlyWiki, but it has the advantage of being able to be used pretty much anywhere in, in Exchange. So let's move on to part two here, um, which is going to be um, about the hierarchy in Grok TiddlyWiki. So an interesting question I've gotten a couple times is um, why, if this is TiddlyWiki, where we're all about um, nonlinearity, um, is Grok TiddlyWiki organized in a series of chapters and sections that moves kind of one way? So um, we can say, why is Grok TiddlyWiki linear? Um, the answer is actually quite simple, um, but I think it would be helpful to, to draw a couple diagrams here just to maybe give you a better intuitive understanding of what the intermixed nonlinear aspects of TiddlyWiki are good for and what the more linear ones are good for. So let's start by example with the TiddlyWiki docs. So you're probably familiar with these. Uh, this is if you go out to tiddlywiki.org or tiddlywiki.com, pardon, um, and you get kind of this uh, system, and you know, I can I often have to look up filter operators, right, so you can search for things, you can find a, a nice list of filter operators, but let's consider the tiddlywiki documentation as a learning resource for a new user of tiddlywiki, so somebody who might be looking at grok tiddlywiki instead. You come out here, you want to learn how to use tiddlywiki, right? What do you do? This is a, a nonlinear platform, so you might kind of come down here and you're like, okay, here's some getting started things here so I can download TiddlyWiki. Okay, that's fine. Here's how I can save changes. Here's some additional information. Like, I don't really know where to go. Here's a thing called a guide. I can look at, well, I guess that's where I already am. Um, some things you can do with TiddlyWiki. Here's just like a list of things I can do, but it's not going to teach me how to do it. Um, what happened to the old TiddlyWiki? I don't really care because I just started using TiddlyWiki. Okay, maybe I need to look at contents. Okay, what about like working with TiddlyWiki? Okay, here's a little bit of information. Like here's how I can navigate between open Tiddlers. I could kind of like paw through each of these things and see them, but like is encryption the number one thing that I need to learn about TiddlyWiki? Like what about upgrading? Well, I just started. I don't need to upgrade yet. I guess there's like features. Uh, do I need to learn about lazy loading? No, that's a super advanced feature, right? I don't think I need to continue with this. Uh, it's probably pretty obvious where I'm going, right? It's not clear what I should learn first. Um, everything, everything is in here, and 
you know, if I'm a, an expert user, uh, this is actually a great mode. So let's look at macros. I was looking at this earlier today, right? If I want to know more about macros as an expert user, I can come in here and like, oh, there's great. There's all these links to other things. Like here's a, a separate thing about the syntax. If I need to look at that, if I wanted to know about pragmas, which is how I define a macro, well, I can go read about pragmas here. Um, and so by splitting this up into these little tiddlers, I have exactly the piece of information that I need in, in one tiddler or in a couple tiddlers that I can switch quickly between here. But as a new user, I don't have any of the context that I need to navigate this. So we might say that, um, this is a term by um, Ted Nelson, the, the tiddler wiki docs are very intertwingled, right? So everything is just kind of all mixed in. And if we make each of these dots, um, we say this is like a, a concept or um, one concept. Let's let's just leave it at that. Um, so we've got a, a tiddler for each of these, right? And now these are going to be linked together. So let's kind of draw the oops, draw the graph between them. And so we can say, you know, these are some of these are kind of in tight clusters. Other ones might be kind of out here and this one might go like over there and keep going with our little graph like that and what if this one goes over there right so we're going to end up with kind of a, a, a tangled up little thing which is great if you're trying to uh, do one of two things so you're trying to um, explore related ideas. Um, so you just kind of want to move through it in a free form fashion. Um, it's also great if you want to um, have kind of one um, authoritative location for something. Um, which is definitely uh, what the TiddlyWiki docs want there to be. Um, I should also add, there, there's probably a third one. Um, if you don't know um, what order something will be useful in. So if you try to organize things into a hierarchy and you don't know what order they're going to be useful in, you're just going to kind of make something up. And it's probably going to force your notes into an order that doesn't make any sense. So that's intertwingled. Let's write this here. In contrast, let's look at what Grok Tiddlywiki has done. So here we're going to have Grok Tiddlywiki. I'm going to say that this uses a linear model. And so we're going to draw this out. We're going to have a series of nodes. But they're all going to go in one direction. And we could say, you know, maybe there's this many sections in chapter one. Here there's chapter two. All right, so chapter one is like the the shape of TiddlyWiki. Chapter two is filing and organizing, right? And we can kind of trace one path through these. It's going to go, and we can even label this like um, level of understanding. So the stuff on the left is going to require much less background knowledge to understand. The stuff on the right is going to depend on things that have been introduced further um, in the past previously. And there's not going to be any dependencies where, you know, in order to understand this one, uh, you actually first need to understand this one. Now, there are going to be links, right? So, um, you know, we might say, well, here's some related topics that we previously talked about. We also still might say, you know, here's a thing in, you know, later in chapter two, we're going to learn that also this can be used for X, but we'll talk about that later. So that can kind of give people a, a preview of um, how things, how else things might be used, uh, even though they don't understand those things yet. It can just give you a, a broader understanding of, of how things are working with that individual topic. And if you're curious, you can follow it up and jump ahead. But for the most part, you can just know, yeah, that's going to come up later. And so this is also useful in specific situations, right? So when there's one obvious order that something should be in, um, you know, of course, if you're, say, writing a novel, right, your order might be this event happened before this event, and that's the most sensible way to understand it. 
obviously there are some novels that, that don't exactly follow that for various reasons, but um, oftentimes there is a straightforward order, or at least uh, you mostly want to follow that order. And uh, certainly, you know, when you do know what order things will be useful in, uh, that's, that's kind of the same thing. You know, if you know that's the order that things will be useful in, it's probably um, pretty obvious. And um, when you don't understand the topic yet, um, it's almost impossible to navigate your way through the intertwingled structure when you don't actually know anything about the contents. Because in order to navigate through intertwingularity, you have to be able to understand what things are related to what other things, at least roughly and conceptually. Otherwise, you're not going to know what set of links you have to follow, because often you have to follow a couple links to really get to the right information. We could also just kind of draw a correspondence here, right? And so what Grok Tiddlywiki is essentially doing is just taking each of the component, uh, each of the concepts out of the Tiddlywiki documentation, and it's putting them in the right order. Um, the order which is, you know, obvious, uh, what the, the order in which the beginner needs to see them in order to understand. Certainly, Grok Tiddlywiki is not just plagiarizing the Tiddlywiki docs, right? Um, we're Talk, we're writing about the stuff in terms that makes more sense to the beginner, and um, some of it is probably an improvement in terms of clarity of explanation. Um, some of it may be worse, but um, by and large, it's writing about the same information in the TiddlyWiki docs, just in an order and using language that makes more sense to users as they come along. So that is the linearity question. The last thing I want to talk about is um, we might call it like interweaving of platform and content. So let's call it that. Um, we can just say platform and content. So this is a thing where I think TiddlyWiki is really revolutionary. And it's basically the story of why Grok TiddlyWiki is written in TiddlyWiki, right? One reason that Grok Tiddlywiki might be written in Tiddlywiki is just because it's kind of cool, because I like Tiddlywiki. Um, another reason could be because it's good to eat your own dog food, as the, the marketing speak says, right? If you're developing a, a product or you're writing about a product, it makes sense to do it using that product. You're showing that that product works and that you like it by using it, and uh, you're getting it an opportunity to test it out and make sure that it really works as opposed to just kind of chucking it over the wall at the people you're developing the product for and hoping that it works well for them. You already know that it works well for you because you used it. However, there's another kind of deeper truth about um, why TiddlyWiki is a good fit for this. Um, specifically, it's why TiddlyWiki is a good fit for developing a next generation textbook, right? One that has new features that most textbooks don't have that can't be implemented on paper. Um, in order to do something like this, you really need the ability to experiment. You don't always know what's going to work well at the beginning. And so you have to work through a, an iterative process of guessing, hey, I think this is going to work. You see how it works out once you've implemented it, and then you uh, come back and uh, do another design phase, another implementation phase, and um, come closer to the, the final product. And this is often pretty hard to do um, with traditional systems. So. Let's start out by, I'm going to say um, red is view and black is third party. And we'll see what this means in just a second. So a traditional system starts out with, um, this is going to be your, your work or your, your um, book or whatever you might want to call it. Let's, let's call it your product. And this is your product, so it's in red. However, your product is going to consist um, in large part of a third-party component. And then it's going to have a little piece of its own here over here as well. So um, we can label these uh, the platform and the content, thus the title. So the content is going to be obviously the, the words that you write or you know images and flashcards and, and whatever else you might put in there. And then the platform. So this is immutable. It can't be changed. It's proprietary. Um, it's written by somebody else. Um, and it's all or nothing. So 
if you like the platform, you can use it. If you don't like the platform, your only recourse is to go pick a different platform. You can pick up your content and transfer it to a new platform, but uh, the platform is going to probably improve some things and make other things worse. So it's not something where you can just necessarily improve your product by moving it. And um, furthermore, obviously, it's difficult to pick up your content and move it to a new platform. There are probably going to be some things that uh, don't work as well on the new platform or where you need to end up uh, modifying your product a little bit in order to make it work. We might uh, call this the walled garden model. Um, so you choose to use this platform. Um, you develop it kind of within the walls of this platform. Um, you don't have the ability to change anything within the wall here. Um, you can only put your little content on top of it. Now, uh, a more flexible model is uh, one that works roughly the same way, except the platform is open source. So in this case, um, we're going to have more red. So or actually, let's use orange because it's, it's going to be slightly different. So instead of the, the black third party here, we're going to have um, we're going to be like this. Let's write that in up there. Um, you third party, and we're going to just call this uh, free and open source software. Or maybe we can call it system here because it's not necessarily software. Um, so this is going to be the platform. So in this case, there's a slight difference in that the platform can be modified. So we'll, we'll call it mutable. Um, we'll say uh, you can integrate to integratable right so we we might have a plugin which which we wrote or somebody else wrote and you can take this plugin and kind of zoop it into the platform so that the platform can be be made to do something that it didn't previously do or that it doesn't do by default over here you're still going to have your content so um, let's let's also draw a plugin here that uh, that you wrote that's in red um, just so that we can see that the plugin can be either open source or um, something that, that you developed custom. However, nevertheless, the plugin and the content are still entirely different things. So in this situation, you can kind of modify the platform to make it work a little bit better for your use case, but you still have a platform and you still have content. So I'm going to call this the dualistic model, right? There's, there's two completely different parts, the platform and the content. And um, another thing about the dualistic model is that these are going to use different tools. So um, in a typical um, book or content management system, right, this platform might use, say, like Python or PHP or something like that, uh, typically a, a programming language, whereas your content might use, I don't know, like restructured text or HTML. Um, this is just an example. The uh, particular uh, tools used aren't, aren't very important, but these are completely different. You can't um, you know, come implement changes to your platform in HTML. Uh, if you want to do that, you have to go in and modify the, the platform using this separate tool. Um, you, you've got to develop the plugin out somewhere else. You've got to upload it to the server and add it to the platform. You have to change the platform in, in one way or another. So it's a completely different activity. So uh, different tools and different activities. And this is going to be the key difference uh, with the third item is in, in the third model, not only uh, do you have the ability to modify the platform, but it's actually part of the same workflow. And so in this model, we're just going to have one box. And it's going to be platform and content. Now, there's probably going to be a, a part of the platform and content uh, that we can fit in here. So this isn't probably quite honest. Let's have a component down here. Um, in TiddlyWiki, we might call this the core. Um, so the core is a, a part of TiddlyWiki that comes when you just go download TiddlyWiki. You can alter the core in some ways. That's why it's still in orange here. It's open source. Um, you're generally going to want to avoid altering the core if you can. Uh, but if you need to, you can. There are also probably going to be third-party plugins that you include in here. But ultimately, in this model, you own the platform as well as the content. What's more, there's only one tool. So um, we're going to just say there's one tool. 
there's no difference between the platform and the content, ultimately. Now, typically, you're going to want to make a distinction between parts of it, right? It's going to be kind of frustrating and, and difficult to maintain. If I have mixed in a, a bunch of complicated formatting and, and say, you know, part of my spaced repetition flashcards program, all mixed in with my description of how tiddlers work. You know, that's not generally how you're going to want to design your system in TiddlyWiki or in any other system that combines platform and content. However, I could if I wanted to. And in order to switch between platform and content, um, I'm still using the same tool. All I need to do is open in TiddlyWiki a different tiddler and start working on it. And so I'm going to call this the unified model. Um, there's ultimately not really a difference between the platform and content. It's really an arbitrary distinction that we apply in order to make it easier to think about how the system works. Whereas in the dualistic system over here, um, there really is a difference. The platform is written in a different language. You have to do it as part of a separate process. Um, over here, we're just kind of choosing to, to divide it because it makes better sense. And I think we can kind of also draw a little uh, diagram here of, of how we're typically working on this, right? So in the, the dualistic model, we do the platform and then we do the content, and then we publish it. So you know, we might pick the platform and, uh, and install it, and then we write our content, and then we publish it using that. Now, you know, if at some point there is a problem, we can come back and we can revisit our, our decisions on the platform, but we're moving out into an entirely different design uh, phase here. We're, we're stepping out to a separate activity. Probably we're going to have to take a couple hours doing something completely different, like finding a plugin and configuring it or writing some new code in the system. So there's uh, a, a separate stage there. Whereas in the unified model, um, we just work on our platform and we work on our content and we just go in a cycle here. Um, we might work on some content and then discover there's something missing from the platform and you go and fix that in like five minutes and you come back to working on the content. You might even switch back and forth between the content and the platform so that you can see the effects of your changes to each being reflected in the other. It's a completely different development experience, right? So as I'm working on Grok TiddlyWiki, right, at some point I didn't start out planning to do these spaced repetition flashcards or takeaways at all. Um, it was an idea that I learned about integrating these with a book in the middle of writing the book. And so I just said, hey, let's try this out. And so the first thing I did was I imported this add-on um, that I made here called Tiddly Remember that just displayed these. And I said, okay, you can review it out using the third-party software Anki if you want to. And I tried that, made sure it worked, and I, uh, in fact, I ate my own dog food there, and I started reviewing my uh, cards as I wrote them to make sure that they made sense. But then I thought, well, let's see if we can integrate it into here. And so then I added this list capability here, and I added kind of a, a basic scheduler. And then later I came back and I added the view where it only shows one card at a time because it's less overwhelming. And I added the ability to add your own takeaway and I added the ability to get help and, and so on. And so as I actually used it and determined other features were necessary, I came back and, and worked more on it. You know, I could have accomplished this using a separate platform and content model, uh, you know, using the, the dualistic model. I doubt I would have though, because it would have been way harder um, and so with Unified, there's absolutely no friction. It's so much easier to make entirely new things using this combined platform and content model because it is just so easy to switch to the platform. You can have an idea and play with it. And if it doesn't work, you could just delete that tiddler and be done with it. Um, you can't really do that on uh, separated development. Also, tools that combine the platform and content typically have faster and easier platform development. That's not necessarily the case, but you know, TiddlyWiki, it's a lot easier to, to spin up a UI and, and create something that works than it is if you're using PHP. Um, even if you're very familiar with PHP, um, if you have really any TiddlyWiki knowledge at all, it, it is going to be faster in TiddlyWiki. Of course, PHP can also do things that TiddlyWiki can't or that are very difficult in TiddlyWiki, but um, you know, the, the platform plus content model will typically get you at least 80% of the way there. And you know, in TiddlyWiki, if you need to, you can also write one of your plugins in JavaScript to give you that additional general purpose uh, tooling that would come built into the, the separate platform and content. So I'm really interested in seeing uh, more of these combined platform and content tools. I think TiddlyWiki is an excellent one. Uh, there are almost certainly others that we could benefit from. Um, TiddlyWiki works great for developing hypertext-like stuff. Hypertext-like stuff works well for a wide var variety of things. 
but there are definitely um, use cases where a different, more specific platform would be valuable. Um, TiddlyWiki is almost certainly not the best hypertext and platform plus content tool one could create. Uh, maybe someday we'll have something even better, or maybe TiddlyWiki will evolve, evolve into that. But first, I think we need to get more people interested in, in understanding the benefits of this platform and content model. Fortunately, if you're interested in becoming one of those people, Grok TiddlyWiki will teach you how to do that. So um, I hope you can see why Grok TiddlyWiki is different and uh, why it works for that through this video. And I hope that if this works for you, you consider what projects uh, you have that might be able to, to use some of these insights about you know when it's good to have intertwingularity, when it's good to have linear stuff, and, and you know with these links, how you can kind of combine the best of both worlds in, in some situations. And also um, developing entirely new tools and, and new kinds of media to go with your content. Being able to, to create those new things um, really makes your life easier as you're designing content. You can create these, these little miniature abstractions that, that make your development easier. Sometimes they're visible to the user, sometimes they're not. And this is something that software developers have been doing for years and years, but that hasn't really escaped out into the world of, of content creation or even really the spreadsheet. Um, you know, it requires a little bit of of understanding and practice in order to do it well, but nothing that can't easily be taught in a book the length of Grok Tiddlywiki. So that's kind of my dreaming for the future here. Um, I hope you enjoy this little talk and um, hope to see you back for parts two and three when they're available. Thank you.